Hi, and welcome again to Pearl Magazine. Nonprofit organizations providing social services play a crucial role in Hong Kong as they provide vital help for people in need. But over the past two years, as the world has struggled through the COVID-19 pandemic, non-governmental organizations or NGOs in Hong Kong are finding it increasingly difficult to fulfill their missions, putting some of the city's most vulnerable at even greater risk. Pearl Magazine's Gabby Shu found out how NGOs are trying to help those in need when many are struggling themselves. On this morning, a group of social workers stream into an office in Sham Shui Po. They're here to gather food to distribute to the needy. This particular NGO has been collecting and donating food. When they first started in 2011, they had only one food donor. By 2021, the number of regular donors had jumped to 200. For our regular donors, that include uh, supermarket chains, retailers in wet market, and uh, food wholesalers and individuals. During the pandemic, we have temporarily suspended all the regular food donations at uh, supermarket chains, as well as the wet market. So that's why, in fact, the um, amount of food rescue has dropped significantly. Instead of collecting food from markets and school partners to avoid waste, the NGOs now must buy fresh food themselves and collect packaged food through newly designed machines. This empty canteen used to host people in need, but nobody comes here now. On the ground floor, a kitchen can produce 4,000 to 5,000 meals a day, but it has stopped serving since the Chinese New Year holiday. Because of the pandemic, we have to close the uh, hot kitchens. So instead of providing hot meals, we provide uh, cooked two meals instead to the needy community. But frozen and chilled meals are not popular with some of the elderly. Good morning. Since his wife passed away several years ago, 87 year old Uncle Chung has been living in a small subdivided unit. Social worker Wang Mei Yi is here, not just to distribute food, but also for a visit. Uncle Chung can speak a little English and enjoys singing. He taught Chinese for six years and then worked as a carpenter for 20. Ms. Wang says Uncle Chung's condition is not as good as it was when she visited him last week. He doesn't remember when he got food last week. I used to collect the food over at Nam Chong Estate on Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Now there's nothing. They gave me hot meals, now it's frozen food. Hot meals are better. I can't eat frozen ribs. I feel it's a waste if I throw them out. For the elderly, our experience is that they really enjoy hot meals. That's why Uncle Chung said that just now. Some think frozen food are leftovers, so they feel they are not good. Some old people insist they want hot meals, but now, due to the pandemic, we can't offer that. Ms. Wong has decades of experience as a social worker. She says the most difficult part of her job is to satisfy different people's expectations, especially when requests for food assistance have soared. At the beginning of the fifth wave, the number of food applications increased more than 100 times. But while the need for assistance is greater than ever, NGOs have had to suspend volunteer services during the pandemic. 
We suspended all volunteer service now. Generally, we would need 250 volunteers every day. Before the pandemic, many volunteers provided help. For each meal, we had more than 10 volunteers to serve the elderly. As the manpower shortage hinders the work of NGOs, one NGO has a special crew of volunteers. Michael used to sleep on the streets. He was sleeping outside the Hong Kong Cultural Center in Jim Sa Choi two years ago when he first met Ng Wai Tung. Ng works for the Society for Community Organization. He eventually introduced Michael to an affordable hotel room funded by the government. Michael no longer sleeps on the street, but he and Ng stay in touch. Michael now helps Ng distribute food and supplies to others in need. Today, they're giving assistance to an elderly lady with cataracts. Our office serves homeless people, rehabilitated offenders, and people recovering from mental illness. Today, we are focusing on giving out supplies to elderly people. In the past, we helped people like Michael, who is homeless. Now, volunteers like him want to contribute. We encourage them to volunteer. We now have eight former homeless people as volunteers. We save ourselves in society. SOCO has mobilized three teams of volunteers. If people test positive and call, we send supplies. We received 5,000 rapid test kits and gave them all out within a week. Over the past two years, workloads have been heavy. We give out COVID-19 service kits to neighbors thanks to donations. We have been distributing food non-stop Monday to Saturday, including to those who test positive. It's very serious. There were no kits from the government and no hospital vacancies even after calling 999. The heavier workload is partly due to a crushing surge in demand amid the fifth wave. Requests for help from homeless people, for example, have increased because some people cannot return home to the mainland. Michael returned from mainland China to Hong Kong two years ago. He had been working in Hong Kong but living on the mainland before 2020. When we did a survey in May 2020, homeless people in this category accounted for 30% of people. They never needed help before. I lived on the mainland for more than 10 years. Every night after finishing work in Hong Kong, I went to Shenzhen. But the pandemic came and the border was closed. One hour before the border shut down, I went to Shenzhen to pack some clothes and returned to Hong Kong. At first, I rented a hotel for $300 a night, but I soon used up my money and had to sleep on the streets. To help homeless people through the government's transitional housing plan, SoCo rents the hostel, and then the homeless pay $2,550 per month for a room. The plan has already helped 80 homeless people. Ng says their funding of $140,000 used to be able to support the service to resettle street sleepers for a whole year. But within three months last spring, all the money had been used up. On the floor Michael lives on, there are six rooms, five of which are occupied by people working in the catering industry. They distributed supplies to all six rooms once a week. If Soko doesn't give out food, what can we eat? Nobody has a job, including me. 
Michael said because he received a lot of help from NGOs when he was sleeping on the street, he finds time to help out and give something back now. The first time I helped giving out food was at the cultural center 6 o'clock. I gave out food with Brother Tung. There were around 400 homeless people. After being on the front lines of charity work, Michael now understands the stress they're under. Today I called the Salvation Army to book a doctor, but couldn't get through. My hands are peeling and I can't even get medicine. Due to the pandemic, the demand is huge. When we come back, more charity organizations without financial support struggle to keep up. Stay with us. Welcome back. In Hong Kong, NGOs differ as much as the range of clients they serve. But in difficult times with a need greater than ever, many unsubsidized NGOs are struggling to keep up. Gabby Xu met with volunteers at one international NGO that has long been focused on helping people in other poor regions. Lately, they've been turning more of their attention to Hong Kong communities. This is a keychain made by people who are poor, but this is made out of a bullet shell that is made by people who are poor in Cambodia. And this employment helps them to feed their families and send their children to school. This teddy was made by this lady, and her name is Florence. And each one of these has a different person, a different story, a different family that's being impacted. But we want to help many more people like Florence. David Begby is the director of Crossroad Foundation, an NGO mainly serving people living in poor countries. One way Crossroad helps those in need is by operating this fair trade shop. Sales in Hong Kong used to be the main source of income for Crossroad, but lately there are no customers. These days, it's not just that our shop sells less, but the person who made it is not getting income. So of course, we have online shopping, but it's not quite the same. The nine-acre former army base in Toon Moon is rather quiet these days. Outside the shop, they also keep goats, which many people would come to feed. One of the things that goats can do is that uh, a goat can bring a family employment. You can use milk, you can have children. In previous, uh, pre-COVID, we would have about 20,000 people a year coming onto our site. So for us, these guys are a little bit lonely. Another COVID-induced issue for the international NGO is the rising cost of fuel and containers. The situation for many refugees is increasing, uh, especially around uh, uh, Moldova and Romania and Germany, caring for refugees. Uh, we have hundreds of containers of resources, and Hong Kong keeps wanting to give us more. Some shipments might be 3,000 or 6,000 US dollars, but now sending the shipments out, the price can be three, four times that, and even the cost of the containers is, go is going up. Crossroad not only serves people in developing countries, it also cooperates with local NGOs to distribute necessities to the underprivileged here in Hong Kong. All of these resources that we have, half of it goes to help Hong Kong, to help Hong Kong's NGOs, and the other half goes to 100 countries around the world. Hong Kong has basically everything, but we don't have a very big second-hand market in Hong Kong. And so many, many uh, banks give us their computers or their furniture or hotels renovate or families give us their resources. Some of these things are needed locally. Many local students need computers as some struggle with online learning. Hey guys, what are we doing at the moment? We are testing a monitor, computer monitor. Excellent. So every computer, that's a computer that we send out, yes. needs to have a monitor. Where did these ones come from? From a bank or from this a... This is from a JP Morgan. Okay, brilliant, 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 brilliant. Oh, hold that side. There we go. Put it on top. 
This afternoon, Wing, a Crossroad volunteer, is sending laptops to NGO partner Hans Anderson to help underprivileged children. Microsoft. 11-year-old Javi previously used a small iPad she borrowed from her school. The size like this. When I'm primary six, I need to give uh, the iPad to school. It's school's iPad, not mine. No, um, school doesn't give me the computer. We take class on the Zoom. I do my homework in Google Classroom. I'm very happy I have the new computer. I think learning computer is very hard because sometimes I don't know how to use them. My mom and dad can't teach me because they don't know how to use computer. David says his NGO's most valuable assets are not the donated items, but the volunteers. He's one of them. I can eat. I can brush my teeth, I can wash my hair, but I don't have any salary to work here. But if I can be very honest with you, I love it. I love my job so much. I love being able to serve, and it's been so precious. We have many people who have been serving here more than 20 years. The NGO has 45 full-time staff who come from 20 countries. None of them get salaries. And in these challenging times, COVID has even disrupted part-time volunteering. Crossroad is a rare breed among NGOs in Hong Kong. Local NGOs spend most of their budgets on employee salaries. And because it's not a funded NGO, Crossroad receives no government subsidies. According to the Inland Revenue Department, in 2020 there were about 9,200 charities registered for tax exemption, a rise of 168 percent from 2001. But only 169 of them are government-subsidized NGOs whose recurring expenditures are funded with taxpayers' money. Those who receive government funding under the lump sum grant that means they have a stable funding. The others, they have to rely on uh, charity donations or any other kind of run by, owned by the big companies. As COVID has pushed many activities online, including shopping and learning, NGOs are also shifting their workshops online. I'm engaged, I'm nervous. I don't see anyone saying prepared. Okay, that's good. At least like one student is prepared. Tiffany is a full-time staff member for Kelly, an NGO focused on drug and alcohol prevention among youth. We were able to invite a speaker from Alcoholics Anonymous. So then the speaker was able to share her own um, life struggle with um, alcohol. And then we're able to prepare the students with some motivation uh, interviewing strategies and how they are able to practice empathetic listening and also um, learn how to support their peers through this experience from the speaker and translate it into their school as well. Ernest is an international school student. Since last October, he's been taking part in peer facilitator training. He prefers a real-life in-person workshop as it can convey more feelings. And I just feel like in person, uh, there's a level of human interaction that is uh, crucial to uh, solving issues that NGOs are uh, setting out to solve. Kelly's executive director, Sky, says face-to-face -face connections provide better support for young people. Yes, you can do everything online. You can facilitate online workshops. But the key uh, area that you need to be able to support them when they're vulnerable. Unsubsidized NGOs provide help by offering support, but sometimes they need help too. Most NGO work focuses on school partnerships, and most of the money comes through designated projects. We were definitely one of those NGOs who had to consider whether or not we will continue to operate. Because at that time, most of our project funding was tied up in projects, and the projects we were not able to run. And we had a very, very short cash flow. 
Sky and leaders from other small unsubsidized NGOs like Shalini from Zubin and Su from Hands On Hong Kong decided to create a task force two years ago and started pushing the government for funding support. And at the beginning of 2020, um, we came to, a few of us came together to say, are you nervous? <laughs> are you concerned? You know, we had just, um, we were concerned about paying our, our salaries. We were listening to the views of the different NGOs and we ran a survey and over 150 NGOs participated in the survey. We learned that NGOs were very concerned about sustainability of their operations. Mm. So we went to see at that time um, the Secretary for Labour and Welfare and we presented to him that the survey results which showed uh, NGOs were very concerned. Eventually, the government included them in the employee subsidy system, but they still face employee burnout with increasing needs. They say the funding system needs to be more flexible in how the money can be used. While there is no legal definition of NGO in Hong Kong, they are vital. 90% of social services here are provided by NGOs. Professor Leung says Hong Kong needs to appreciate them more. NGOs varies a lot, in, uh, and they try to retain their distinctiveness. Uh, and that's the value of NGOs, and the value of the spirit of Hong Kong, of civil society. People can are free to organize. And then if they can find the resources, they survive, they, they thrive, and, and then uh, they achieved their missions. That's our show for this week. Join us again on Pearl Magazine next time. Bye for now.